In the previous two videos, I did two examples of integration using the Riemann definition. It was miserable. Even for simple functions like quadratics or cubics, I was mired in a difficult limit involving complicated sums and sum identities. I need a better way. For derivatives, the solution was a bunch of rules. There are indeed a bunch of rules for integrals, some of which I'll do next week, and some of which will wait for calculus too, but all the rules actually come from a single source. There is one key idea that makes the integral approachable, and I'll go over that key in this video. I need some groundwork before I get to the main result. With definite integrals, thinking of the top bound of the integral as a variable lets me define new functions. Many functions in mathematics are defined this way. Look at this first expression. f of x is the integral from a to x of g of t. I have some function g of t, which is already known. I have some fixed starting point a. Then this new function f of t measures the area under the graph of g up to some point x larger than a. And I can get different areas by changing this upper bound. So it's a reasonable place for a variable. There are three other functions on the slide here, which are definitions from other parts of mathematics. These are functions with mat which mathematicians use for various purposes. The first is the Fresnel function, given by the area under the composition of sine and t squared with some constants involved. The second is, less creatively, called the logarithmic integral function, and the third is the sine integral function. I'm not going to use these even more than introducing them, and you don't actually need to know anything about them, but I wanted to show some actual examples from elsewhere in mathematics to show that this is a real idea, a way that we actually use to define functions. Going back to the first function on the previous slide, f of x measuring the area under g of t up to some value x. g is the graph here, and f is the area starting on the left and ending at some place x on the t-axis. Calculus is about change, and I've already understood derivatives, so I can ask, what is the rate of change of this function f? What is the rate of change of the area under the curve? To do this, thinking about the definition of the derivative, I need to ask for the difference between f of x and f of x plus h when h is small. Let me label this. x plus h is a little bit more than x. When the difference between f of x and f of x plus h is just a difference in area. If h is small enough, this extra area is very nearly a rectangle with width, with width h and height g of x. I lose a tiny triangle at the top by saying this, but the small, smaller that h gets, the less that that matters. Now let me put this idea in the definition of the derivative. Here is that definition. I just said that this numerator, f of x plus h minus f of x, is very nearly the rectangle with height g of x and width h. So this is the product I use for area. As h gets very small, this rectangle fits nearly perfectly, so I can use it in this limit. Then the h terms cancel, and I get the limit of just g of x as h goes to zero, but there are no h's left, so this limit is just g of x. So the rate of change of f of x is g of x. But g of x was already defined as, f was already defined as the integral of g. This is the main idea. The derivative of an integral gets me back to the original function. This is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. It has several forms, but the idea is the same for all forms. The derivative and the integral are inverse operations. To take a derivative and then to take an integral is to do nothing. The integral of a derivative is just the original function. Here are two other versions. The first says, what is the area under the graph of a derivative? The fundamental theorem says that the integral and derivative should cancel, and they do, but I need an area, area here, an actual number. The number I get is f of b minus f of a. I evaluate the original function, f not f prime, at the endpoints and take the difference. The implementation is a bit different, but the idea is the same. The integral of a derivative gets back to the original function. Finally, this gives a way to calculate integrals. If I have an integral from a to b of f, then using the previous line, the previous idea, 
the answer should be some function evaluated to b minus some function evaluated to a. What function? Well, some function that is the inverse of the derivative. Some function capital F such that capital F prime is the original F. This F is called an antiderivative. It's doing the derivative backwards. And this is what I need to evaluate integrals. I need to do derivatives backwards. This is what the fundamental theorem says in all of its forms. Integrals are derivatives backwards. There is notation for this. I can use the integral symbol, but without any bounds. This no longer means area. It can't because there aren't any bounds to define the area. Instead, it means do the derivative backwards, the antiderivative. This is called the indefinite integral. The function e to the x was the unique function that was its own derivative, so logically it should be its own antiderivative. The indefinite integral of e to the x is e to the x, since the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. This is indeed true, but with one subtlety. The derivative of any constant is zero. Derivatives destroy constants. But antiderivatives, indefinite integrals, are doing derivatives backwards. Therefore, instead of destroying constants, I should be creating constants. And this is again indeed what I do. Every antiderivative can include the addition of a new constant, since the derivative would destroy that constant. The antiderivative e to the x is e to the x plus some constant c. Let me do one more before I finish. The power rule said that the derivative of x to the n is n x to the n minus 1. The new exponent is 1 less, and I multiply by the old exponent. What is the inverse of this? Well, instead of subtracting from the exponent, I add. The new exponent is 1 more, n plus 1. And instead of multiplying by the old exponent, I divide by the new exponent. So dividing by n plus 1. And as before, I add a constant. This is the inverse power rule, doing the power rule backwards, and I can now integrate any power of x and by linearity any polynomial. There is again one subtlety here, n cannot be negative 1. And for fairly obvious reasons, if I put n equals negative 1 in the above form, then I would get division by 0, which obviously doesn't work. n equals 1 is the function x to the negative 1, which is just 1 over x. So what is the antiderivative of 1 over x? Well, you may remember from derivative examples that the derivative of the natural logarithm was 1 over x. So going backwards, the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural logarithm plus a constant. And this is almost perfect. The result is actually the logarithm with the absolute value. And this is another strange subtlety. For positive x, this works out as before. But if I don't know if x is positive or negative, then I actually need this absolute value. Integration is full of these kinds of strange subtleties, and I'll try and explain a couple of them before the course is finished. For now, the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural logarithm of the absolute value of x plus a constant. Finally, let me actually calculate an integral this way. I calculate an integral by finding an antiderivative and then evaluating on the endpoints, f of b minus f of a. There is a nice evaluation bar notation for this, the vertical bar with b at the top and a at the bottom. This means evaluate at b and then subtract the evaluation at a. So what is the integral from 2 to 4 of x squared? What is the area under the quadratic between 2 and 4? This is a power rule situation. I just said in the previous slide that the antiderivative has a new exponent, one more than the old, so x squared becomes x cubed. And then I divide, divide by the new exponent to get x cubed over 3. This is the antiderivative. Then I evaluate at 4 and subtract the evaluation at 2. I get 4 cubed over 3 minus 2 cubed over 3, and the result is 56 thirds. Hopefully it's easy to see that this was much, much, much easier than using the limit definition. Finally, you might ask, well, what about that constant? You said that I needed to add a constant. Well, for indefinite integ integrals, absolutely you do. However, for using the antiderivative here, the constant isn't needed, or equivalently, you can just choose the constant to be zero. Why doesn't it matter? Well, when you evaluate at the top and then the bottom and then subtract, 
the constant is in both evaluations. So you would get C minus C at the end, which just cancels out. It doesn't show up, so you can ignore it or equivalently set it to zero.